Hi everyone, Mrs V here and today we are going to be learning about the collision theory of reactions. So let's get our PowerPoint on and learn more about how chemical reactions occur. Of course, before a chemical reaction can occur, the reactants must meet. We call this a collision. But we'll see that there's much more to getting a chemical reaction to occur than a simple collision. Let's have a look at a reaction between two molecules, A2 and B2. What needs to happen for this reaction is a molecule of A2 needs to collide with a molecule of B2. The existing bonds, the A to A bond here and the B to B bond here, they have to break and then new bonds need to form between A and B. So we need to form these new bonds here between A and B. That seems simple enough. Not every collision actually results in a chemical reaction though. In fact, in the air around you, molecules of hydrogen and oxygen are colliding around about 10 to the 30th times every second. But most of the time, the molecules just bounce off each other. No bonds are broken, no new bonds are formed. Two criteria need to be satisfied before a collision results in a reaction. First of all, the molecules have to meet with the correct atoms together to react. This is called having orientation requirements. And secondly, the molecules have to have enough energy to break their existing bonds. This is what we call energy requirements. So in this ineffective collision that we're looking at, where no reaction has occurred, one or other or both of those conditions have not been satisfied. An effective collision is one that results in a chemical reaction. Old bonds break, new bonds form, and we get products. If we have a look at the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen here, we need hydrogen and oxygen to collide with the correct orientation. So here's our oxygen. Our hydrogens will need to actually be lined up when the molecules line up like this, the old bonds here can break, new bonds can form, and we're going to form two water molecules. So correct orientation is important, but also these molecules have collided with enough energy to break those original bonds. So there are both orientation and energy requirements before a collision between molecules can actually result in a chemical reaction. You can have the right orientation, but not enough energy. You can have the right amount of energy, but poor orientation. And neither of those is going to give you a reaction. You'll get an ineffective collision where the molecules just bounce off each other. To get an effective collision, you need both the energy and the correct orientation. So it's not enough just to have the molecules colliding. The right parts of the molecule have to collide. In this example, to make AB from the reaction of A with BC, the A has to collide with the B part of the molecule. That way a new bond can form between A and B and the old bond between B and C can break. But if A collides with the C part of BC, then no reaction is going to occur. A can't make its bond with B, so we will get no reaction. Not every molecule is small like A or BC. Large molecules might contain only a very small reactive section, and that means it's really difficult to get correct orientation. So let's have a look at the reaction between ethanol here and butanoic acid. The reaction of these two makes an artificial pineapple flavoring. Now, these sections that are circled in blue have to collide to enable this reaction to occur. So imagine those molecules are spinning and tumbling as they move around. It's really unlikely that the right parts of the molecule will ever meet. And that's going to make this reaction really slow because only a tiny proportion of collisions between the molecules are actually going to result in a reaction. And ethanol and butanoic acid are not even very large molecules. Imagine trying to get a collision at the reactive site that's circled on this molecule. So that's the importance of correct orientation. Now let's talk about energy. 
molecules might collide with the correct orientation, but without enough energy to break the existing bonds. So those molecules will simply bounce off each other without reacting. So even though in this collision here, A2 and B2 have collided with perfect orientation for the old bonds to break and the new bonds to form, they've collided without enough energy. If the sum of the kinetic energy of the molecules is too low to break their bonds, then those molecules just bounce off each other. Each reaction has its own activation energy. This is the energy barrier that prevents most collisions resulting in reactions. It's a good thing really, otherwise there would be uncontrollable reactions going on all the time. You would actually spontaneously combust in the air. Every single fuel would burn as soon as it was exposed to oxygen in the air. So it really is a good idea to have an activation energy for each reaction. The sum of the kinetic energy of the molecules must be at least equal to the activation reaction and there has to be perfect orientation. Then and only then will this collision result in a reaction. Activation energy is shown on an energy profile diagram as the difference between the energy of the reactants, which is this energy here, called the energy of reactants, and the energy of what we call the transition state. So we'll call that E of transition state. And that difference is called activation energy. The transition state is the point where the old bonds have been broken, but the new ones haven't formed yet. The transition state can't actually be isolated, so you can never actually have a beaker of transition state. This particular reaction shown is an exothermic reaction. This reaction produces heat or energy. We'll just say it produces energy, usually as heat. Energy is required to break the bonds in the reactants. This is energy that breaks bonds. From the transition state, new bonds form and energy is given out. So here energy is given out as the new bonds form. Now because in this example we didn't need to put as much energy in as we got out, overall this reaction is going to give out energy. We might see light or heat or even hear sound being produced when this reaction occurs. This energy profile shows an endothermic reaction. This reaction actually takes in heat. You're still going to require energy to get to the transition state to break the bonds. And energy is still going to be released when new bonds form. The difference here is that we did not get as much energy out when the new bonds formed as when we broke the existing bonds. So overall, this reaction is going to take in energy from its surroundings. So we might feel the test tube get cold in such a reaction. Let's have a look at the reaction between hydrogen and chlorine. So this would be hydrogen and chlorine reacting to produce hydrogen chloride. Let's assume here that the collisions are all occurring with perfect orientation. So we have our hydrogens here and our chlorines here in perfect orientation to react. In this first graph, we see that the sum of kinetic energy of the hydrogen and chlorine molecules was greater than or at least equal to the activation energy so we could achieve the transition state. So the old bonds have broken here. The hydrogen to hydrogen and the chlorine to chlorine bonds broke to form the activated complex and now new bonds can form. So here we have our new bonds have formed and we have our hydrogen chloride product. 
In the second graph, the hydrogen and chlorine have collided, but the sum of their kinetic energy was less than the activation energy. That means the existing bonds did not break. No activated complex was formed. No products could form. So we get here, no reaction has occurred. So in summary, in order that a collision between two molecules can actually result in a chemical reaction, the molecules must collide with perfect orientation for reaction and with enough energy to break the existing bonds. It's quite surprising that reactions ever happen, really. Well, now you know just that little bit more about a chemical reaction occurs, you are ready to start talking about some factors that affect the rate of chemical reactions. So that's what we're going to be doing in our next video. If you found this video useful, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel where you can watch more and more videos and learn more and more about chemistry. I'm going to see you guys in the next video.